Greetings. We are going to start in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 7, around verse 15. I'm going to give a brief synopsis. And my goal today is to show you a parallel between the Old and New Testament, which it does, but it helps folks to understand the mystery of the gospel and to, to know the new before you delve into the old. And once you have an understanding and the eyes are understanding enlightened, then you're able to go back and see some of the parallels of the Old Testament. So I'm going to start with a man named Samuel, a prophet that maybe uh, in layman's terms sometimes would be called underrated, somebody you don't hear a lot of. When you think of prophets from the old, you think of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, uh, did I mention Abraham and uh, Jeremiah? But Samuel was a very effective prophet. In fact, they made mention of him in in and these are side notes right now. But nine six said all that he says comes to pass, that which is a sign of a prophet that when they say something, it actually comes to pass. And in seven fifteen of First Samuel, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. So the Lord had picked a judge, an effective judge, to help teach the law to the people and to help them understand the Lord's doings. And in chapter 8, when he was getting older, in verse 5, the people said unto him, Behold, you are old, your sons walk not in the ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Whoops, there's a red flag, folks. Like all the nations. What does the Bible say about friendship with the world? Or being conformed to this world? Yeah. It tells you not to be conformed. But don't do things because everybody else does it. That's what I see a lot in ministries today. Everything's cookie cutter. I've been criticized because I don't have a congregation, a building, or a, what do you call those uh, teletrons in front of the building giving uh, instructions on when our Bible studies or whatever. I don't have a choir. Well, <laughs> I don't need one. I'm here to teach the Word of God, show you who you are in Christ. And Samuel went on. And the thing in verse 6, the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And I say that because it sounds familiar with what I see today. Replace the word king with a pastor. Somebody that they can else to rely on. Somebody else, and as we go on here, in fact, um, someone to fight their battles, basically. Well, folks, you've been given the Holy Spirit. You've been given the armor of God. You've been given the measure of faith. You have everything needed to make it home. So that's why I titled this King of Kings today. Uh, let's Let's go with the king. Let's go with somebody who's been crowned already, somebody that's made at home. Let him lead and guide you into all truth. And so he told them that they had not forsaken him. And he tried to explain to him, say, okay, and I'll go, I'll continue here. In verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto you unto thee. And, it, and basically the Lord is saying, well, hearken unto their voice and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told the words of the Lord unto the people that asked the king in verse 10. And as we go on, he said in verse 11, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He shall take your sons, appoint for himself chariots, horsemen, and run before people to run before his church. He, appoint, he will appoint captains of thousands, captains of fifties, set them to re ear his ground or plow, to reap his harvest, to make his instruments of war and instruments of chariots. He will take your daughters, confectionaries, cooks, and bakers. He will take your fields and vineyards and your olive, 
yards, the best of them, and give them to his servants. In other words, this guy's going to be calling the shots. And he will take a tenth of your seed, of your vineyards, and give to his officers, to his servants. Isn't that what we hear a lot about today? A tenth. That's all we hear about with a lot of organization. Tithe, 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 tithe. If they didn't have tithing to talk about, I don't know if they'd have any messages to preach about. So you can see, it started back then. Everybody wants a tenth. And he will take your men servants, your maid servants, your goodliest young men, and your asses and put them to his work. Well, to put it in layman's terms today, they want to get your asses out in the field and get working as well. And uh, he will take a tenth of your sheep and you shall be his servants. So, folks, what I'm saying is those that learn don't learn from history. History has a tendency to repeat itself. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you should have chosen. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. And then people went on. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and said, No, but we will have as a king that we also may be like the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man to his city. So it's similar to today. Today, people rely too much on other people. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 5. Your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And our Lord talked about that in John 5, 40, 44, that he receives not honor from men. In fact, just a couple chapters before that in John, book of John 2, 24, he said, um, that he did not commit himself unto man because he knew what was in man. He didn't trust man. And why would he? I mean, how fickle is mankind? You think about it. One week he was riding in to town and they said, hail to the king. And a week later, crucify him. Well, we'll give you a choice between Barabbas, a murderer, or Jesus of Nazareth, who has done all these wonderful work. Ah, we'll take Barabbas. Release Barabbas. Crucify the, the king. And so, folks, the pattern or the parallel is there. You don't want to put all your eggs in a carnal basket. You don't want to trust in man. Not when you've been given the Holy Spirit. That's why the Lord died. That's why he sent his son, so he could pour out his spirit upon all flesh. So, as we go on, and the Bible talks about, in 1 Peter 5, 3, about the people not being lords over the flocks. Not to have dominion over the people because that's what they'll do they'll try to have dominion over your faith and again if you go back to the first king saul it's not like this guy had a, a a squeaky clean track record i mean this is a guy who consulted the witch of endor in chapter 28 um i believe it was chapter oh, the disobedience took place in chapter 15 when he was supposed to wipe out the Amalekites. And in chapter 22, he killed a bunch of the priests of Nob because of his envy and strife trying to chase down David. And eventually he himself got killed in battle. So he was a bit of a tyrant himself. And Samuel confronted him one time, and that was in chapter 15 of Samuel and said, when you were small in your own eyes, God anointed you. And uh, our last study, we had talked about making a lasting impression, humbling ourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. So you can see why you don't want to rely on man all the time. You don't want to put your eggs in that carnal basket. Let me give you uh, another example here. In John 6, Speaking of kings, and this is, uh, Jesus said in John 6, I'm at verse 15, Jesus had himself had just fed the multitude. And these were an impoverished people under the strict rule of the Romans. And when Jesus, Jesus in 6.15 perceived that they would come in by force to make him a king, he departed again into the mountain himself alone. 
And again, you can read this whole chapter, but down in 26, he said, and Jesus answered, said, Verily I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Well, at first glance, you'd think, well, who better to make a king than this Jesus of Nazareth? Well, yes, you want him to be the king of your Jesus Christ today, the king of kings and lords of lords. But they had the wrong motive. And I see this with many Christians today. They come to the Lord because they want a belly full. They want their businesses blessed. They want the outward man taken care of. They want a, uh, the family portrait at the holiday time of the nice family sitting together, a refrigerator full of food. Life is good, but they don't want to deal with the cross of Christ, the persecution and the afflictions that go along with living a godly life. They don't want to hear about that. So many people today want to make the Lord himself a king, but for the wrong reason. That's why he goes on in verse 27, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which, meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. So then they looked at him like, well, what are we supposed to do then to do the works of God? And it was real simple. This is the work of God in verse 29. Believe on him whom he has sent. There it is. It's not about, well, let me give you another example here. Matthew 23. And this is so fitting. Of a lot of so-called pastors, prophets, of these so-called leaders today. Uh, 23, verse 1, and this whole chapter describes what I see going on out there. The scribes and Pharisees in 23, when G, okay, 23, 1, spoke Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them upon men's shoulders, but they will not move them with one of their fingers. And all their works they do to be seen of men. <laughs> I've seen so much. I get a kick out of it. Well, you need to live by faith and you need to trust God. You need to give your offering. And if you don't have it, trust God and he'll, he'll send it. Then they turn around at the end of their message and say, yeah, but we're supported solely by your gifts and offerings. Wow. What about this faith stuff? Why aren't you trusting in the Lord? Why are you trusting in the people and binding these birds? We're supposed to do all these things and you live high off the hog. Um, verse 13, Why won't you scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you're, neither do you go in yourselves, nor will you suffer them that are entering to go in. You're not teaching sound doctrine. It's watered down, wishy-washy, milk toast, Doctrines are not going to get you home. It's not of the Holy Spirit. You may have begun in the Spirit, but you're not going to finish there. You thought you could perfect it, perfect it by the flesh. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. That's, well, let me go on here. Uh, you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. When he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell. Now here's the one in verse 16. Won't you blind guides, which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is debtor. In other words, they're all caught up in the money. The money is more important than your commitment to God. Oh, faith, mercy, love, die into self, taking up your cross following the Lord, uh, commitment, loving him with all your heart, love thy neighbor as yourself. Nah, don't worry about that. But let's get that gold to the temple. Let's get that support in there. That's what's most important. And folks, the love of money is the root of all evil and covetousness is idolatry. And we sure have a lot of idolatry out there. Oh my God, especially in the quote unquote church. It's all I hear about. And he goes on in verse 17, you fools and blind, which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? Whosoever shall swear by the altar, eh, don't worry about it. But if you swear by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. <laughs> Bound. Oh, and then he goes on to talk about which is greater, the gift or the 
the altar that sanctifies it, because the altar represents God. What is your commitment to the Lord? And I again, I listened to, uh, and so much on tithing, a tenth, a tenth, a tenth. I prayed about it one time. I asked the Lord, I said, so do you want a tenth of my tithe? And he, the Lord responded in a rather interesting way. He said, do you want a tenth of me? And I was sat back for a little bit and I thought, well, what are you talking about? He says, I just, and the Bible talks about that. And it's that simple. In First Corinthians, is it Second Corinthians 9? Talks about the cheerful giver. What a man proposes in his heart to give. That's how simple it's got down. Second Corinthians 9, 7. Every man according as he proposes in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. Now, let me go back to what I said. Was the Lord asking me for more money like you hear a lot of people? Uh, no. He said, you give 100% of what I ask you. Whether it is more, whether it's less, or how about even nothing? Obedience is better than sacrifice. You know, we talked about Samuel, and you'll, that was quoted from 1 Samuel chapter 15. When Samuel was, uh, Saul was trying to justify himself, and so Samuel's response was, I don't care about all these sacrifices you think you're offering. Obedience is better than sacrifice, ladies and gentlemen. Today, these are the kind of people we have in so-called people if allowed to, to fight their battles, that they want pastoring them. And your Bible talks about many false prophets, not just a few, many false prophets shall arise. And as a side note, you can go back and look at Jeremiah 5.31 and Micah 3.11. It talks about how they prophesy for hire. These people are bought off. They sold their soul. They have no backbone. I'm going to close here in 2 Corinthians 11. I think you're getting the message, folks, of what the Lord is saying today. You have the Holy Spirit, 1 John 2.20 and 27. And the Holy Spirit will not lie to you. It does not have uh, an agenda. It will not try to uh, get into your back pocket and, and fleece the flock. Second Corinthians, on the heels of the false apostles, Second Corinthians 11, 13, he talks about false prophets, apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. That's what you have out there, what we just read in Matthew. And some of these folks are like dictators. You got to do this. You got to live by faith. You got to, and they themselves. And then they live high off the hog. I don't get how these people live so high on the hog and the, and the fleas. You know, it's like, where's the equality? Acts talks about they had all things in common. You go back throughout the Bible, it talks about equality. He that gathered much had nothing left over. He that gathered little had no, you know, had no lack. Where's the equality? Why are some of these people living so high off the hog and you're sitting there scraping? And then they're still hitting you up for a money pitch. Yeah. Uh, uh. And Paul gets a little sarcastic here in 16. I say again, let no man think me as a fool. If otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. So he's going, I'm going to give you a little piece of my mind here. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing yourselves are so wise. Some of these people you've put into uh, the office of, a, of, of leadership. How foolish, how pathetic. They did that in the Old Testament. They took the lowest of the people and put them in the priesthood. Now, <laughs> history again repeats itself. You suffer if a man bring you into bondage. Well, you, we, you're you bound to, the, to that gold of the temple and you, you're part of this organization. You owe, you owe, you owe. And we want a tenth. That's how they, their tithing went out the window. It's not, it's not a part of the new tithe. Keep it simple. If a man bring you to bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you in the face. What a slap in the face, these people. The, the message is the watered down, wishy-washy messages that I preach, and you sit there and support it. And they treat you like something nasty underneath their shoes. 
And then he goes on, and you can read the rest of this, how he talks about his own experience of being called of God and a true prophet of the Lord. Okay, folks. Anyways, I hope we got this point across because there's many false prophets out there. And you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you don't go to the Lord and establish a relationship with him one-on-one -on -one and let our Lord, and, and with the right motive, folks, feeding the inward man, not just the outward. So for yourself, find out who the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords is. 